operating room, we use a tourniquet on the proximal thigh and a thigh holding device and then prep the, the leg free as we can see here at this right lower extremity. And the incisions we use when we use a hamstring tendon graft are really very small. We have two arthroscopy portals and everything inside of the knee joint is done arthroscopically or with a fiber optic telescope. And then we have one incision about an inch long which is directly over the, the location where the two tendons that we use for a graft insert. We then isolate the insertion of those two tendons and this, these are the semitendinosus and gracilis tendons just as they're inserting into the tibia right at this location. So we release those, those two tendons from the tibia and then separate them and then use a tendon stripper and this device is a is it, we slide right over the tendon and advance it up the thigh until it hits the, reaches the muscle belly and removes the tendon from the muscle belly. And then we take that tendon and cut it to the length that we need and use its suture technique through each end of that tendon that we will use later for fixation of the graft. And then once we have obtained the two grafts, we double both of these grafts and pull them through a sizing tube so that we know just what the size of those tendons are so that we can make the tunnels in the joint with through the bones just the smallest that are, that are possible to accept those grafts. And then we're going to look inside of the knee joint with the arthroscope and, and instead of seeing that nice anterior cruciate ligament that should run right here, we see fragments of that anterior cruciate ligament, a torn anterior cruciate ligament. And if we pull on the lower bone and do a Lachman test, at this, this time we can see that the lower bone moves forward and there are none of these fibers that are going to take tension when we do that. So we clean that out of the way. Once that anterior cruciate ligament is torn, it really is of, of no function and it's just in the way of where we want to put the graft. So we've cleaned that out. The posterior cruciate ligament is right here. And then through that same incision where we harvested the tendons, we, we take a drill guide and start a, a guide pin that comes into the knee joint right here. And this guide pin, we can fine tune its location until we have it exactly where we want it to place the tibial tunnel. And once that, that's been done, then we use a cannulated drill to, to slide up that tendon into the knee joint and create the tibial tunnel. Then through that tunnel we can create the socket in the femur where the graft is going to go and we use a, a drill guy that's schematically demonstrated here and we can see inside the joint here. This positions to the back of the joint and allows us to put this guide pin right where we want it. And once we do that we use a, set, a different type of drill that we can pass through the tibial tunnel up to the femur to create this uh, socket in the femur to accept the graft and this is what that looks like. Again, we, we start the tibial tunnel here, drill into the joint and after that's been created we go through that to put the socket up here in the femur to accept that graft. And there are different ways of attaching the, the hamstring tendon graft or any graft to the various bones and the, the fixation method that I prefer to use on the femoral side or the upper side is this endo button and what this is is a a little flat button that we can pass up a tiny, tiny passing channel and then flip it and that is attached to a, a tape that comes in various lengths and we measure the size that we need there and then we can loop the tendons through that to pull them up into the femoral socket. So this is, these are some hamstring tendons prepared to become an anterior cruciate graft and this is the, endo, the tape that connects these to the endo button. And so this schematically shows that socket we make and then we have this little passing channel for the, for the endo button. And we pull the grafts, here are the looped ends of the grafts going into that tunnel. The tape fills the tunnel and then the button is pulled out and flipped to lock it up to the upper bone. And this is just a picture of that tape pulling the, the hamstring tendon grafts up into the femoral socket. Then on the opposite side, on the tibial side, we take each graft separately. Here is one of the tendons and here's the other and we place a screw and washer and we actually tie these around the, the screw which is a post and then after we fine tune the tension we then advance the washer down with spikes to fix not only the graft but the sutures and the knots as well. And this is then what the anterior cruciate ligament graft looks like. We have again the posterior cruciate and these are the, the strands of semitendinosus and gracilis tendons that are the ACL substitute. And then the patient needs to go into a rehabilitation program. When we initially attach the ligament to the bone, we have enough strength to allow somebody to, to bear weight immediately and to come off crutches as soon as they feel comfortable and to get on a stationary bicycle. 
but we also need to hold the graft in place until the body can biologically attach it, and that's a process that goes on for about 18 months. And we don't keep the person out of high-level sports for 18 months, but we do like to keep them out about eight months. And so, so just a quick synopsis of our rehab protocol is we do this as an outpatient, brace them for the first six weeks, crutches whenever they can tolerate, usually they're off by two weeks. They're usually working out on a bicycle by two weeks. And most activities can be accomplished at 12 weeks, but we keep people away from the high-level jumping and pivoting sports until about eight months. And this is an example of, of that scar. It tends to be very cosmetically acceptable, only about an inch long. And even though it's a fairly large surgery, we do it through fairly small incisions. So the next person I want to talk to is James. And uh, James is a former collegiate football player who managed to get through a football career without injury. But after that, how did you injure your knee, Jim? Well, I was playing soccer. Uh, ball was played through. And the keeper and I were kind of running that the same, you know, run at each other, and we collided chests, and my left foot had stuck into the ground and spun me as we hit chests, and I just felt it kind of go pop, felt heard, whatever, it hurt. <laughs> and Jim is, brings up an interesting point, and that is the timing of surgery. As I saw Jim uh, probably within a week of the time of his injury, and it was very impressive that he could not straighten his knee. And he lacked about 15 degrees of straightening his knee, and it was mechanically locked so that he couldn't straighten his knee. And ideally, we like to wait after somebody has this injury until the knee swelling is gone and their motion is returned before we operate, and that makes their post-operative rehabilitation a lot more predictable. But there are some situations where we can't do this, and this was one of those because his medial meniscus was not only torn, but it was displaced and mechanically locking the knee joint. And this is, is an example of, or this shows Jim's knee, and this is the upper bone, and this is his meniscus that should be running back in this position, but it's been moved at the front of the joint and is actually mechanically blocking his motion. And so for Jim's surgery, what we did is we reduced that meniscus, and again, this is the torn area. And this is an ideal opportunity to repair this meniscus. And I think when it's done acutely and in association with a procedure to stabilize the knee, there's a fairly high success rate in, in salvaging this meniscus when it's torn in this location. So we use a rasp to freshen the edges of that tear, and then a cannula from inside out to pass sutures, multiple sutures, to repair that. And here's an example of three of those sutures, and there are about three more in this area. And then in the extreme back, there are a couple of bioabsorbable bio tacks that are used to secure this meniscus. And when we do this, then we have to also change the post-operative course. And, uh, Instead of uh, moving as quickly as we did in, in a patient like Denise, we like to keep a person with this kind of a repair on crutches for six weeks and limit motion, limit motion which uh, you're just at a point now where you're starting to get full motion. Is that right, Jim? And you're about how far out from surgery? Uh, 11 weeks post-op. Right. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a lot tougher task because we didn't let him do a lot of things in the first six weeks, but he's catching up now. So. This is a picture of that ACL reconstruction in, in uh, Jim's knee. And the next person I want to talk to is Bill. And uh, Bill, how did you injure your ACL? I injured it initially skiing. Um, same type of fall, slow, slow fall, flat terrain. Yeah. Then I re-injured it um, by getting my foot in sort of a weird position when I was climbing. Yeah. And did you come out of your bindings when you no. when this injured? That's one of the, probably the single most common thing about ski injuries is usually when you tear an ACL ski and you didn't come out of your binding. And oftentimes that happens when the, the load is a slower load rather than a high speed load exactly. because the bindings don't release as, as quickly under that situation. So you tried to get back and do some for a while then to live without your anterior cruciate, is that right? And my friends that the, the ski, the, the, the jury was sort of out, they sort of said, half said, yeah, you don't really need it, it's overrated, and half said, now you need to get it fixed now. Um, and I was sort of went into a strength program and was going to try and just, you know, increase the strength of my legs and um, and see how it went. But when I re-injured at skiing, it sort of, uh, excuse me, when I re-injured at climbing, right. it sort of drew a line and said, you either need to get it fixed or go do something else. Right, and the key with, with uh, Bill is that he's the only person on this panel who's close to my age. And uh, people used to think that people in this age group didn't need an ACL, but the, clearly the thing that is, is important here is activity level more than chronologic age. And, and people more and more 
at older ages and younger ages are being involved in sports on unpredictable surfaces. And uh, I think because of that, this is a more appropriate consideration for more and more people. And the last patient I want to talk to is Dylan. And Dylan, how did you injure your ACL? Well, um, I did I did gymnastics, and I'm pretty good at it. And I was getting ready because there's I was a meet that was coming up soon, and I was practicing this thing called a blind change when you're swinging around this bar fairly high up and you have to let go with one hand and then um, do a 180 and then grab it again and I didn't grab it I kind of missed it and but I hung on with one hand because my coach said it's better to hang on than let go because you're probably gonna do something worse if you don't hang on so I hung, I hung on then kind of slipped off at the bottom and Land, uh, kind of landed funny, not landed funny, but I was, I fell and kind of fell sideways, and so, um, yeah, I just heard it like that, and then I did a roll and landed on my side. Yeah. And the th the thing that I that is interesting about Dylan is that it's his age. He's, Dylan has just turned 13. He was 12 when this injury occurred, and we're finding that more and more of these injuries are occurring in children in this age group. And the problem here, uh, a lot of people do not like to reconstruct anterior cruciate ligaments in this age group because he still has a growing skeleton and some of the things we do to put tunnels across uh, bones ha at least offer some risk to future growth. And it would be ideally desirable to wait until skeletal maturity before doing this, but we know that if someone continues to do high level sports and jumping and pivoting and continue to injure their knee, that they start to tear menisci and pretty soon the risk of this is much worse to the future of this knee than there any risk of surgery. And so after all of these considerations, we went ahead and, and did surgery in Dylan. And one thing we noted was this tear of his lateral meniscus, which fortunately was stable and it was beginning to heal. And I think that this has an excellent chance of healing if we just can stabilize his knee. And we went ahead and, and stabilized the knee. In this case, since Dylan still has a lot of growth left, we decided not to harvest any of his own tendons but instead went to a tissue bank and used an allograft tendon as a substitute and, and put that in for this ACL. And, and Dylan has done very well from that. You're, how, many, how many weeks ago was it that we, you did your surgery? Ten, and yeah. Yeah, and Dylan is, is, I think the important thing here is we're gonna have a hard time holding Dylan down because he has his motion back and his knee is, feels relatively normal. But again, the key here is that in, just because a person is this age does not necessarily mean that, that the best thing for their knee is not a reconstruction. And if we are careful of certain principles that we use in children, then this can be successfully done in this age group as well. And this is an example of the tunnels in Dylan's knee, the endo button on the upper bone, the screw and washer, and they're crossing the growth plates, which are in this location. But the point, of, what I wanted to do with this presentation today is just to kind of give a spectrum of the kind of people and the, t and, the, and the variations in the injuries to the ACL. And unlike years ago when this was an open procedure with casting and a, and a fairly significant rehabilitation, now the expectation is the patient can have a full range of motion and a stable knee and this will allow them to get back to the type of sporting activities they like and because of that I think it's becoming a better option for more and more patients. Thank you. Mm -hmm.